Hey everyone, it's Dan Arrows here, bringing you an Iron Dice special. I'm recording this at 11 p.m. Central European time on Monday, the 21st of February, 2022. In this moment, the country of Ukraine, except on its eastern border, stands surrounded by Russian forces. The estimates vary, but safe to say it's over 100,000 soldiers with all the equipment you would need for an invasion. Not just tanks and artillery, but also things like blood reserves, something you usually do not bring if it's not expected to be needed in the future. Russia's Black Sea fleet that dwarfs anything the Ukrainians have has launched extensive naval exercises five days ago and now looms over the Black Sea coast. As of just an hour ago of me recording this, Putin has ordered troops to move into the Donbass and everything points to the conflict escalating even further. Now, three questions for us. What is happening right now? Why is this happening? And what is going to happen next? The commentary in the media has been somewhat all over the place. Over the last few weeks, there have been story after story about an alleged time window for a full-on Russian invasion only for that moment to pass without anything happening. One example from six days ago in the mirror opens with the headline, Russian invasion of Ukraine set for 3 a.m. today with missiles and tank attack. The article goes on to say, quote, Kremlin chiefs will order an attack on Ukraine at 3 a.m. local time today, American intelligence agencies believe. They could target Kiev's military and government command and control centers with a barrage of airstrikes before tanks roll over the border. At the same time, Russian amphibious warships could storm Ukraine's southern coastline. It comes as Foreign Secretary Liz Truss warned a Russian invasion would not stop at Ukraine. Europe could just be a few hours from all-out war in Ukraine, despite last-ditch diplomatic moves and a possible standing down of some Moscow troops. This example is one of the more brazen predictions, but articles of this ilk have been dominating the commentary on this for a while now. And just as an aside regarding Liz Truss, who is the British Foreign Secretary, saying a Russian invasion would not stop at Ukraine, when she was in Russia recently and was asked by a Russian presidential spokesperson if Britain recognizes Russian sovereignty over the Volnevs and Rostov regions, she responded that Britain will never recognize Moscow's sovereignty over these two regions, only for a British ambassador to jump in and tell her that actually they do, because these are Russian regions. So I take her analysis with a grain of salt. Be that as it may, I might have to go into a bit of a personal mea culpa on this one, because initially I did not expect Russia to go as far as it has at this hour. This was in November when first satellite images showed a buildup of around 100,000 Russian troops on the border with Ukraine. The rhetoric coming out of the United States sounded very alarmist. Joe Biden warned Russia not to invade and all kinds of different World War scenarios were being played out in the media. At that time, I believed that this wasn't really something to be concerned about because to some extent, we go through this every year. NATO does a troop exercise in the summer, and then when Russia does their exercises later on, we get all these headlines about what Putin might be planning and such. The last time this happened, in April of 2021, my German newspaper of choice ran a piece claiming that at this point, the occupation of the Donbass region has to be expected. In addition to that, Russia wasn't going to any lengths to mask this buildup, which speaks against the plan of a swift invasion. And in the beginning, the reporting on this did have something of a Dragon Ball Z episode. Every day the invasion was imminent, every day the troop levels are going through the roof. Case in point comes from Melinda Herring, deputy director of the Eurasia Center of the Atlantic Council, the very influential foreign policy think tank in the U.S., on February 11th, she felt confident to tweet out, quote, Putin has big weekend plans for Ukraine. Number one, he's going to cut power and heat, knock out Ukrainian Navy and Air Force, kill general staff and hit them with cyber attack. Number two, then install pro-Russian president. Number three, resort to full-scale military invasion if Ukraine doesn't give in. In addition to these predictions, a couple of let's say media gaffes, didn't strengthen their credibility on this. For instance, NBC and other outlets claimed that the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, had posted on Facebook that the date of the invasion will be 
February 16th, only to retract it once it became clear that this wasn't what he meant at all. In reality, Zelensky had marked claims coming from other countries about the date of the invasion, only for the US media to run with it. At the same time, Ukrainian politicians have been urging calmness and decrying the US stirring hysteria on this issue, until recently. Chief among them Ukrainian President Zelensky, but also the head of his party, said this recently. I think when the phase disappears in two or three weeks, we should do a retrospective analysis of how large, very well-known media began to disseminate information worse than, can't really pronounce it, these are two Russian state propagandists. Frank Fakes and CNN, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, we must study this because these are elements of hybrid warfare. This hysteria is now costing the country two to three billion dollars every month. My apologies for the clunky Google translation. Be that as it may, at this point, my assumption that this was a regular Russian troop exercise turned out wrong. I do think this was a reasonable position at the time, though. If you are confused about what this conflict around Ukraine is all about, I don't blame you. Apart from the messy reporting, there is this tendency online for one side to say Russia is clearly in the wrong here, while the other side points to the opposite direction. I do want to somewhat break out of this tendency with today's show because I don't think it's very useful to understand what is happening. Now, first question. Why is this happening? My apologies in advance for having to leave some stuff out, but this is not me reading off a list on Wikipedia but the events that I deem crucial to understand what is happening. All right, early 90s. Soviet Union collapses. Russia is reduced from great power status to being at the mercy of its main enemy for decades, the United States. At the mercy, economically speaking, I should say. There is some talk from the Clinton administration of integrating Russia into the West, but ultimately the chance is squandered. And what followed is something you probably heard a lot about in the commentary surrounding Ukraine. NATO expansion. Now, a lot of hoopla is made over if the US promised to Russia that NATO would not expand, quote, one inch eastward if Russia agreed to German unification. A couple of Western diplomats support the Russian version that this verbal promise was indeed made. The US denies it. James Baker, who was Secretary of State at the time, says he never made a promise like this. It gets very confusing. For instance, Mikhail Gorbachev first claimed the US did promise not to expand NATO any further, only to later state the opposite. In my opinion, this alleged promise is not as important as it's sometimes made out to be, and I'll explain why later. NATO expands in 1999 as Hungary, Poland, and the Czech Republic join the alliance. Russia is heavily against this, but they really can't do much in their current state. One year later, Russia's official national security concept is warning of, quote, attempts to create an international relations structure based on domination by developed Western countries under US leadership. The second big expansion of NATO happens in 2004, and this includes Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, and the Baltic countries. What is important to understand here is that these enlargements aren't done to make Russia mad or encircle it necessarily, but NATO and EU enlargement are done with the aim of expanding liberal democracy and foster free trade, at least these two expansions. Russia does not see it that way. They view it through the lens of power politics and what looks like the expansion of liberal democracy to us to them, it's an enemy power advancing right up to their doorstep. The straw that breaks the camel's back is the NATO summit in 2008 in Bucharest. There is one point in the summit declaration regarding Ukraine and Georgia that was heavily fought over during the meeting. France and especially Germany were strongly against making a commitment on this front as to not antagonize Russia, but the US got their way on this one. Point 23 of the Bucharest Summer Declaration reads, NATO welcomes Ukraine's and Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations for membership in NATO. We agree today that these countries will become members of NATO. This was one step too far for the Russians, who at this point aren't as weak anymore as they used to be. Russia is by no means a world power, but they are powerful compared to a country like Georgia. I found a news piece from April 2008 from ABC News. The headline reads, Ukraine, Georgia, NATO membership, a quote, 
direct threat to Russia. Scrolling down a bit, the text reads, Following the NATO meeting, the Bucharest summit, Mr. Putin said the presence of a powerful military bloc on Russia's borders would be seen as a direct threat and that assurances that it is not could not satisfy his country. Now, you might wonder, why would Russia have a problem with Georgia or Ukraine joining NATO if it didn't have ill intentions towards them? The answer to that is the same as to why the US would have a problem with Mexico entering a military alliance with China. It's basic power politics. Great powers don't like it when others encroach on what they see as their sphere of influence. That doesn't mean I think Russia should have a sphere of influence or the US should have a sphere of influence. It's just something that exists. You can probably imagine what happened after the Bucharest summit, if you don't already know. In August 2008, the Russo-Georgian war breaks out. Georgia is the one to technically fire the first shot, but this was preceded by strong provocations. That war didn't last very long, as you can imagine, and to this day, Russia occupies roughly 20% of the country. Similar to the current state Ukraine is in, there are two regions in Georgia who are very close to Russia. They also receive Russian passports from Russia, and this sort of frozen conflict and territorial dispute makes a Georgian NATO membership highly unlikely in the near future. That is not the case with Ukraine in 2008. And a couple of years after the Russo-Georgian War, something happens in Ukraine that freaks the Russians out. In November of 2013, Ukraine is in talks with the EU to pass an association agreement that opens up borders for goods, eases travel restrictions, that sort of stuff. But after some stalling, Ukraine's president Yanukovych walks away from the agreement, citing pressure from Russia as one of the reasons. Obviously, Russia is a big trading partner for Ukraine, and Putin used that leverage to get Ukraine to walk away. This sparks a wave of demonstrations and civil unrest in Ukraine, primarily at the Euromaidan or Eurosquare in Kiev. Demonstrators call for Yanukovych to step down, and not just because he walked away from the EU, but corruption is also an issue, human rights, just the general ills parts of the population have with their leadership. The Ukrainian government under Yanukovych brutally cracks down on the protests, totally overreacting to what at this point were peaceful demonstrations. In return, protesters begin to fight back. Some far-right groups inject themselves into this protest and the situation deteriorates very fast. By February, over 100 people are dead. Pressure keeps mounting and mounting and mounting. And eventually Yanukovych flees the country as protesters overthrow his government. An interim government takes power. The state apparatus is cleansed of many Yanukovych loyalists. Eight former officials tied to his party commit suicide or are assassinated. It's not clear in every case. And this event called the Revolution of Dignity or Maidan Revolution or just called Maidan is at the center of the conflict. The West broadly views this as an organic democratic uprising against a puppet of Putin. The other side sees it as an illegal coup against a legitimately elected leader. And by other side, I don't just mean the Russian government, by the way. Shortly after the new interim government takes power in Ukraine, protests erupt in eastern and southern Ukraine against this new government that they view as illegitimate. This spirals into the Crimean succession crisis, and shortly after, Russia rolls in, holds a very questionable vote, and annexes the peninsula. So much for a rough timeline of important events leading up to this. If you try to understand this conflict, two things are key in my opinion. It's the crisis inside Ukraine caused by the Maidan revolution, although this rift has obviously existed for much longer, but also a more underlying cause. This being Ukraine, over time, drifting into the Western sphere of influence. Partially, this happened because a big chunk of Ukraine's population wants to be part of the West and institutions like the EU, but also the West trying to pull Ukraine away from Russia. I know this is not conventional wisdom in Europe or the US, but in my opinion, the tug of war over Ukraine taking place right now could have been avoided but for the West forcing this issue. And when I say force the issue, I don't mean the US is 
forcing Russia's hand in this. Russia is far from being the good guy here. I think the latest events have especially shown that. But the framework of who are the good and the bad sides is not a helpful framework to understand geopolitics. Great powers act in a manner that is broadly predictable. All you have to do to understand this is look at the Monroe Doctrine of the United States. The Monroe Doctrine says that the Western Hemisphere is off limits to any other great power. Why? Because the United States as a world power, views the Western Hemisphere as theirs and has threatened or used force to show their resolve on this. Like creating a rebel army in the contrast to overthrow the Sandinistas after the Nicaraguan Revolution, to name just one example. Now, Nicaragua has a smaller population than New York City. Is it really this hard to understand why Russia acts like it does on Ukraine? A country of 44 million that has a significant historical role for the Russians. Of course, one doesn't excuse the other. My claim is not that Russia is justified in doing any of this, just that the West should have seen this coming. And people like Angela Merkel did, in fact, see it coming in 2008. Still, the US sleepwalked into this, and by sleepwalked into this, I mean they didn't expect this sort of reaction by another great power to them increasing their influence over the world. Putin just hours ago in an hour-long address claimed that NATO expansion's whole purpose was to antagonize them and keep Russia down. I don't believe that to be borne out in the historical record. And me and Putin here are talking about NATO expansion post the collapse of the Soviet Union. So it shouldn't be hard to understand why this is happening at all. Now, a couple of things. Without a doubt, several folks listening will disagree with my characterization or ask how I can point to both sides given that Putin is a despot, has no regard for international law, etc. First of all, I'm not sitting at the UN here. When trying to understand what is happening, I don't really think about it in terms of this country has a right to do X, or this treaty was broken and this means the following. Yes, Russia did break international law. Apart from the way they annexed Crimea, they also breached the Budapest Memorandum, in which Russia agreed to respect Ukraine's existing borders in exchange for Ukraine handing over the nuclear weapons they had after the USSR collapsed. Russia says they didn't breach it again doesn't really matter. The reason it doesn't matter as much to understanding what is going on is that the world is not governed by international law. The world is governed by power. And every great power in the world cares little about treaties or international law the second they believe that there is something in it for them. That is true with the Budapest Memorandum, that is true with the United States invading Iraq, and the list goes on. This is also why I think this endless back and forth about if the US promised not to expand NATO is ultimately pointless. NATO expansion was a mistake either way, and I believe Russia would have acted the exact same way even if they didn't have the fig leaf of this supposed promise as an excuse. Although I don't buy the idea that Putin is this Hitlerian figure hell-bent on conquering territory out of some irrational belief akin to wanting Lebensraum. I think when the Russians say they don't want Ukraine to join NATO, as to not have NATO troops at their doorstep, we can believe this. That said, trying to dig a little deeper, what does Putin actually want to achieve with this latest mass mobilization and now invasion? If Ukrainian NATO membership is the only thing that concerns him, he kind of already had what he wanted. The quasi-civil war in Ukraine put a hold on Ukraine's aspirations to become a part of NATO, and the United States is in the process of leaving Europe in the rearview mirror. They want to focus on their main competitor in China. Still, since 2014, one could make the case that Ukraine did shape up to be a pseudo-NATO member, if you will. They have been getting billions worth in weapons from the West. The US has made it clear that it cares greatly about Ukraine's security, although not enough to commit troops. So while officially Ukraine is not inching closer to being in NATO, it probably looks like that to the Russians. Now, getting to the present. 
please be aware that things are changing very quickly and this part might already be partially outdated by the time you listen to it. A couple of hours before I hit the record button on this episode, Putin held a televised speech, a speech that will without a doubt get its spot in the history books. Among other things, he said, quote, Modern Ukraine was entirely created by Russia, more precisely, Bolshevik Communist Russia. As a result of Bolshevik policy, Soviet Ukraine arose, which even today can with good reason be called Vladimir Ilyich Lenin's Ukraine. He is the author and architect. This is fully confirmed by archive documents. And now grateful descendants have demolished monuments to Lenin in Ukraine. This is what they call decommunization. Do you want decommunization? Well, that suits us just fine. But it is unnecessary, as they say, to stop halfway. We are ready to show you what real decommunization means for Ukraine. He went on to say that Ukraine never had a tradition of genuine statehood and also addressed the issue of Donbas, which is the Russian-backed region in Ukraine. Those who embarked on the path of violence, bloodshed, lawlessness, did not recognize and do not recognize any other solution to the Donbas issue except for the military one. In this regard, I consider it necessary to take a long overdue decision to immediately recognize the independence and sovereignty of the Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic. I ask the Federal Assembly of the Russian Federation to support this decision and then to ratify the treaties of friendship and mutual assistance with individual republics. These two documents will be prepared and signed in the very near future. And from those who seized and hold power in Kiev, we demand an immediate cessation of hostilities. Otherwise, all responsibility for the possible continuation of the bloodshed will be entirely on the conscience of the regime ruling on the territory of Ukraine. The leadership of Donetsk and Luhansk have started to evacuate parts of the population to Russia and have officially requested military support from Russia that is being deployed this very moment. All that said, I still have a hard time believing the scenario that you often saw gamed out in the Beltway media about a full-on invasion of Ukraine in which Russia takes as much territory as they can. I don't see what is in it for them. And while Putin made it clear that he, if he had a magic wand, would revert Russia's borders to the status quo prior to the USSR collapsing, I don't believe that this makes him disregard any real world considerations. I hope so, at least. There was a strong strategic upside to annexing Crimea. There isn't really when it comes to all of Ukraine, considering the backlash Russia would have to endure. Still, while I'm recording this, Russia is occupying the Donbas region. They will cite security concerns and probably also reiterate the accusation that Ukraine is committing a genocide against the Russian population of Donbas. What the Ukrainian government will do in response is another question. The United States and several European powers have made it clear that despite sanctions, they won't send troops to the region. And if this does spiral into an open conflict, instead of the proxy version we got until now, Ukraine doesn't have a great many allies to count on. Although I should say, despite some contrary claims, the Ukrainian army is not a pushover. It might not be as large as the Russian military, but it is well-equipped, highly technologized and motivated. It's gonna get messy if that's the road we go down. Russia will without a doubt be hit with sanctions now, but at this point there is only so much pain you can inflict on them with sanctions. Over the last few years, Russia has been following an economic strategy sometimes called Fortress Russia. They have built up big currency reserves with which they can help out their struggling banks. Russia's finance ministry has stress-tested worst-case scenarios for quite a while now and has a dedicated unit working to counter possible measures taken by the US and others. They started to de-dollarize their economy, all while the EU has not taken big steps in reducing their reliance on Russian energy exports. As of right now, the Eurobloc imports more than 40% of its gas and a quarter of its oil from Russia. So while sanctions still could throw Russia into a recession, if they go far enough, Moscow is very much in a position to retaliate. Okay, now I think I have reached a point in this episode where any further speculation is just an invitation to be proven wrong. 
Usually I say I hope you enjoyed this episode, but that doesn't seem very fitting here. Instead, I hope you were able to take something away from this. I hope it gave you a greater understanding of the issue. And we'll see. Otherwise, stay safe and I'll see you soon.